evening, everybody. Or as Lutz normally says, welcome, welcome, welcome. And uh, Lutz is again ill. We had that ready, I think, uh, in January. Uh, that time was a cold. This time, I think, as Stefan, you said beforehand, you probably took the topic too serious. Um, two years COVID. Uh, he has COVID now for the first time. So wishing him all the best uh, from this part. But that's having said that, I think um, I'll take over now a bit of the introduction, make that a bit longer, and then I'll be rather the moderator. And today we obviously have as well two great guests, and I will come back to that in a minute. So before going to the topic very briefly as well, I mean, you know us, I mean, whoever is following us, obviously, um, with the webinars and the podcast, uh, we are the German speaking market access experts for Austria, Germany, Switzerland, um, uh, giving you opportunities um, with price reimbursement strategy, health economics, reimbursement submissions, and also the negotiation support, and also there with our virtual reality preparation camps. Um, also, don't miss um, our market access podcast. Uh, I think we also just had, I think, uh, two or four weeks ago, an episode together with Stefano, Stefano Capri, but also with other members in the last couple of weeks and months. So just watch that out as well. Important for all the participants, obviously, questions are, as always, welcome. So you can put those into the a comments button of the uh, Zoom webinar or also into the special Q&A function. We will just collect those and then we'll as well include those when we're coming to the, let's say, moderation session when we have our two experts today speaking about the topic and maybe also discussing about different scenarios for the future. Also, if you cannot follow the full webinar or if you want to rewatch it or if you want to uh, um, um, suggest to, uh, to somebody else, just watch out our website and there we have all of the records as well available. <clears throat> so coming back to the topic and our uh, great guests, um, our presenters uh, today, uh, besides myself, we have today Professor Stefano Capri from the University of Cataneo. I think today you're in Milan, right? Yes. Hi, Stefano. Yes. Perfect. Good to Hi. have you. Perfect. Uh, and our thanks. second guest <laughs> is Harald Herholz. Uh, from the KV Hessen. Also, big welcome to, I guess, somewhere in Hessen. I don't know whether it's Wiesbaden, Frankfurt, or any, anywhere else. Frankfurt, Frankfurt. Perfect. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. We listened to your kind of opinions in a couple of minutes. So, before getting to the discussion, we obviously want to launch very briefly, at least, the kind of topic. Also, important maybe for everybody, I mean, who has maybe as well followed or maybe has even. Um, uh, prescribed beforehand. We have first followed, obviously, on the two years COVID-19. That's also where, uh, let's say, the three of us have uh, maybe firstly spoken early this year or end of last year, probably even, where obviously the topic was more prominent. But because of the recent, let's say, situation from a global perspective, and obviously as well, the potential implications for the healthcare, but generally for the, let's say, financial system, we just so do we add here in brackets, but also you have seen that probably on the promotional uh, figure, the Ukraine war, that we have those kind of two components in there. Why that? Because I think ultimately we had two significant, as economists say, external shocks to the world in the last two years. COVID-19, I mean, we're nowadays, let's say, trying to get rid of it, right? Even though that we have still quite high cases in Germany, we speak to that in a second. Obviously, the whole, let's say, kind of virus and, and different uh, mutations have, let's say, changed anyway the situation. But of course, the biggest change was the availability of the vaccination. And now we're discussing, obviously, since four weeks at least, the kind of situation in the Ukraine and the potential impact on the rest of the world on top. So starting first with the COVID-19 situation, I mean, you see there the number of cases per million people. That is basically now just generally around um, across uh, Europe. You see Germany, France, UK, Italy, Spain, different kind of situations when you follow more from the early start. And just remember, obviously, it's a totally different situation when we have spoken with. I mean, nowadays you see the kind of little peaks at the early beginnings of the 2020s, um, where obviously nobody was vaccinated. The kind of wild type uh, virus has had obviously, I think, at least what I have read, 
much higher kind of um, burden on the death rates and also on the hospitalizations. But still, you see those kind of waves and the kind of that's a big wave now in um, mid of March uh, 2022. Because we have obviously focused today, because we have the two guests from Germany and from Italy, we would as well like to focus a bit on those two countries and I think would be obviously especially interested because I know I think Carol tells you have been let's say in the center of the whole kind of let's say pandemic uh, management I think as well from the early beginning so it would be great to hear as well some of those insights how that was handled um, from the early days how that ha that has maybe changed as well over time and obviously as well Stefano if we could listen a bit how maybe Italy has done that in that course of the waves and now how the situations might potentially look um, in the future. What would be obviously as well interesting, not only let's say the management of the whole situation, but potentially also the, um, yeah, maybe impact, I think on also healthcare budgets, maybe as well um, available resources. I mean, we're speaking about nurses and physicians on the one side, but I think I have also heard, for example, that at least during that phases, if we let's say stop shortly before the Ukraine war, um, the kind of focus was at least in some regions as well across Europe, more on healthcare delivery finally. So that's maybe as well something keep in mind how that has maybe evolved and how this could potentially even change now, given the kind of situation and potential other pressures now from the other sides. I think generally, I think just um, taking here a bit um, of the let's say health and budget impacts, I think uh, nothing new. Um, who is probably focusing here, a lot of uh, cases, a uh, significant number of deaths, obviously, I think not only those parts, but I think also long COVID is a big question mark. I think um, uh, it's the same now with the kind of question, what if, let's say, at least a good number of people would get long COVID symptoms um, with a now really high cases, question mark. But I think on top of that, which is the health um, question, it's also then the question, because obviously we have let's say from our perspective, always a bit the market access and reimbursement perspective in mind, the impact from a budget perspective. And I think there was just, uh, just different news here um, uh, that Germany might face 1.3 trillion uh, euros of COVID bill. I guess in Italy, it might be probably quite, quite close to that. I don't even know that if that is the latest number. I think the number is probably even higher. If you take all of the different, let's say, financial, uh, uh, um, let's say, implications as well, into account. So that is maybe the first part of, uh, I think, our panel discussion in a couple of minutes. And then I think the second part where I think, let's maybe try to do that really stepwise, maybe start with, with COVID and then see how that whole situation might potentially be impacted, obviously, not only by the, generally, obviously, by the uh, attack of Russia um, uh, against Ukraine. I think we have quickly spoken about the potential, even, let's say, health impact in a way, for the system um, when, with the different refugees coming from the Ukraine. I think that's maybe one component where I personally think it's probably not the biggest issue, um, but I think uh, um, from a budget perspective, we have seen obviously a big move and a quite fast in general probably move um, in terms of a focus where I think the German government, for example, has just said that they might commit 100 billion euros to the defense spending, which obviously means the money needs to come from where else, right? The cake does not necessarily get bigger. So it's then the question, where does it come from, right? Um, when we have not even spoken about, Stefan, you have just said it before we have started, what about the energy supply, right? What if that might suddenly as well get into a bigger risk than we are currently discussing and how could that potentially be, let's say, transferred? So that's as well the kind of big question mark for tonight. On top, and that's maybe then the question rather um, to uh, our Italian friend Stefano, but obviously how it helps, uh, would be very interesting to see your insights. We have just seen, I think two weeks ago that in the press at least in Germany, um, uh, the, the losses of the Institute of Health Insurance Funds was up to 17 billion euros last year. So also quite clear, I mean, again, the money needs to come from somewhere, right? Even if we take the Ukraine, and the defense kind of um, uh, monetary spending away, and just focus on this part, I think it could have been expected that we might get some further, let's say measurements introduced into the at least German healthcare system. So would be obviously very much interested uh, to hear as well, 
how that might be handled in Italy. And on top, and then we're really getting to the discussion, um, our new German health minister um, has just announced his, I, I was saying wish list, because it was not yet discussed, um, I think, within the parliament, and we need to see how this would really, and what really needs to come maybe into the healthcare system, but it might get really at least a flavor of what we could potentially see in the next couple of months. I think just a couple of things here, pre-pricing within the AMLOC might be cut from 12 months to only six months. Um, there might be different kind of, let's say, volume related aspects in the contracting also within the AMLOC. Um, the annual say threshold, which was for orphan drugs, still until now 50 million. Uh, might potentially newly be introduced with only in quotes 20 million euros. Um, that's a, a bit of, let's say, uneconomic package sizes. It might be, I think that might be maybe even a kind of bigger impact. At least some of our clients have already, let's say, get a, close to a heart attack <laughs> when they have just seen that the potential monetary manufacturing rebate might be increased to newly 19%. Um, so that's maybe as well a, an important consideration and a couple of further things which might potentially as well become into effect. So let's just see what might really come true, but I think it might especially also be very interesting to hear your kind of thoughts, but maybe I think uh, we give you the floors if we could maybe start first with the COVID-19 discussion from health impact, from a, from a public spending budget impact and how especially maybe that was also handled in the various region. I mean, maybe hard health, if you could maybe start, especially maybe with the management, maybe from the early days and how this is now going, would be really great to hear that. Well, when I look back and consider the last two years, I think there were three major issues or focuses. At the beginning, it was clearly all about testing, how to test the value of antigen rapid test, the value of PCR, uh, we had to build up the testing facilities uh, all over the country, a special focus on PCR. We had to determine the validity of antigen test, and we had to establish a testing strategy. So that was a major issue in the first six months, I would say. And then vaccines became available. And, and here, uh, the biggest issue was certainly shortage of vaccines. And we had the problem with the safety of, of the vector vaccines. Then we have a shortage of mRNA vaccines. And then some people thought, well, the new protein-based vaccines would be the big solution for certain people or certain parts of the society that was reluctant with uptake, uh, which turned out not to be true, quite frankly. And when this was over, and the, the last phase was about treatment. So we had... Uh, antiviral treatments available and antibody treatments available. Then the question was how to order it, um, how to use it. And all in all, my perception was that uptake was disappointingly low, both in the hospital sector as in the ambulatory sector. Well, and um, what is the takeaway from this um, COVID uh, pandemic? It led to some changes. Um, here in Germany that will prevail. And that is, for instance, the online treatment. GPs, many GPs found it useful. And to my surprise, many psychotherapists said that was a good idea. No, 10 years ago, they said, no, I need to smell the patient. I need to have direct eye contact. It's impossible. And now many says, well, I will say, I want to go on. That was a good idea. It's convenient. And the patients asked for it. So not just the psychotherapist. And that is just one example where I see we will have many things that will prevail even when the pandemic is over. And maybe that was good that e-health um, uh, had a certain push here forward. Um, we still have problems with e-health in Germany, no doubt about it. But maybe more GPs now say, well, I would like to make greater use of this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a very good kind of summary. <laughs> yes, I think uh, I would even just uh, maybe add, it was not only 10 years ago with the psychotherapist, we had a, a project uh, to manage, or let's say to potentially reorganize uh, psychotherapy, uh, uh, let's say the situation in, in a local area close to here. And uh, we had a lot of discussion with psychotherapists and that was three years ago. 
and they were mm. quite reluctant. I mean, it was, let's mm. say, 60, 40 or 70, 30 split against anything like e-health, right? Yeah. I agree, it was more the smell, right? And we need <laughs> to see the patient. I fully agree. That was funny mm. that you mentioned that. Perfect. Um, Stefano, how, how, how was it managed, especially in the early days in Italy? Was that similar to Germany? Obviously, the situation well, uh, with the shortage, uh, et cetera, uh, is clear, but what about the uh, rest of that? I think that uh, I will focus on the major difference mm -hmm. between Italy and Germany. The first <laughs> is uh, quite a, 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 a major difference, and we don't know exactly why, but uh, fortunately for Germany, the number of deaths was uh, uh, definitely less than in Italy. And uh, honestly, it's difficult to understand uh, how it happened. Mm -hmm. Also because uh, the the restrictions, uh, lockdowns uh, uh, were more uh, severe in Italy, but even so, uh, the number of deaths, uh, the death rate was, was, was higher. But another important difference uh, is related to the supply of healthcare resources, because uh, compared to Germany, the number of ICU units in Italy per thousand inhabitants is definitely lower than, than Germany. So uh, I remember at the beginning that uh, we were absolutely surprised to see how many uh, uh, um, ICUs uh, you have in Germany compared to Italy. And obviously, particularly in the first part of uh, the uh, uh, of the pandemic uh, was a, a absolutely a severe problem. Uh, but uh, one similar aspect, if I understand correctly, is related to a lack of, uh, uh, particularly in Italy, efficient community care. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we had and, and we still have problems with the GP's uh, uh, network, uh, GP's activity, uh, with uh, ambulatory in the territory. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the all uh, uh, impact was almost completely on the hospitals. And obviously this is not, uh, is not a matter of, of obviously only of efficiency, but also for the patients was uh, very, very bad. Uh, the home care, for instance, at the beginning, they decided everywhere to organize uh, uh, some units of physicians and nurses uh, able to go to, 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 to home in order to visit patients but very small uh, units, very few units, not efficient. So it uh, was very difficult. And uh, uh, taking into account all these aspects, I would say that the only quite efficient uh, uh, mechanism was the vaccination mechanism. Italy was quite on the top uh, of the countries in terms mm -hmm. of uh, vaccination rate. The organization was very good. Just to say that the responsible for the vaccination uh, uh, um, program in Italy uh, was a general uh, uh, of the army, <laughs> uh, which means something, but was very efficient. <laughs> uh, I see. I, I said was because exactly uh, today is the last day that uh, this general is, is in charge. But there is a new general, it's still from the army, taking again uh, the responsibility. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, the, the major aspect, uh, apart from this organizational, uh, is related to the clinical impact, because in terms of morbidity and mortality, uh, so not only in terms of management, but morbidity and mortality, the impact was uh, quite dramatic, really. I'm not, I'm not talking about just uh, uh, the people that, that died by COVID, which is obvious, <laughs> is related to. But for instance, I have just some numbers. Uh, uh, in the 2020, compared to the year before when COVID was not there, we, we, we reduced the number of hospital stays for more than 1 million of hospital stays. Uh, and, uh, uh, and a lot of visits uh, we, 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 uh, have been lost, which means that uh, particularly in oncology and, and in, the, in the other surgery intervention, probably uh, we have uh, some increasing number of, uh, of deaths. Uh, it's not clear now the calculation, but uh, the deaths related uh, directly to COVID are definitely more than the official numbers because we have quite a lot of number of deaths uh, in oncology, for instance, 
because mm -hmm. they were not able to be uh, uh, surgical operated, for instance, or, or they, they, had, they had to stop some treatment or some monitoring, uh, uh, screening, uh, and so. So this is, was uh, particularly impacting. And for instance, the life expectancy in 2020 uh, uh, has been reduced uh, by 1.2 year, which is uh, mm -hmm. something <laughs> just for one year. Even, even if uh, uh, Italy is still with 82.4 uh, years, uh, one of the countries in the European Union with the highest uh, life expectancy, but it, this is obviously quite a, 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 negative, uh, a negative impact. So I think in summary, these are the major impact uh, in terms of uh, uh, clinical aspects. Then maybe later on we can discuss uh, uh, more precisely the impact on the economic issue, particularly related to uh, uh, healthcare spending, uh, pharmaceutical spending. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, a, as a short summary, the impact uh, uh, of COVID. And uh, uh, yes, about the community care, uh, we, we knew before the COVID-19 that our system was uh, progressive, uh, uh, progressively centered on the hospital in the last 20 years. Uh, that was not a surprise to see that, that we have, uh, we have a, a, a lack of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of community care. And this is a problem that probably is going to be, I don't know, solved, but uh, they are talking about some reform, but it's still uh, uh, in progress. So this is quite yeah. important. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I, th I think that's big and important differences. I think what you have just laid out, I think in terms of system, but also, in terms of, uh, let's say, the outcomes. But I think in a very important point, what I would now to take up again, was I think you said supply of resources. And I would maybe want to, again, push a bit, not away, but put that on top maybe of the health impact. I mean, hard health. I mean, do you see or have you seen in the last two years a change in terms of, let's say, the, the importance for, let's say, not only for the healthcare system itself, but I think especially, let's say, for the providers there. I mean, today, I think we had another strike in Berlin, for example, by healthcare workers, mm -hmm. right? I think I'm not knowing what is what were the outcome you there yet, but do you see a change there? And maybe also refocus again, just before the, the war, right? In terms of the, let's say spendings maybe for the healthcare system in general? Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, oh, was no. I don't know. Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. I believe it was for me. Please, Harald. <laughs> Yeah, well, not, not in terms of, of spending, because the flow of spending is regulated and there were no changes. The general perception in the, in, in the public, in the society, sure, nurses, mm -hmm. physicians, mm -hmm. but their reputation was high anyway, I would say. What was more appreciated by politicians, I think, was a GPs mm -hmm. and their uh, good job in terms of vaccinations. And also the doctor's association's reputation increased because they had to build up the whole infrastructure for testing facilities. And um, yes, and there were some changes also in terms of uh, lab, lab doctors, laboratories. Now, they were usually the bad guys in the last 20 years. They, everyone said, oh, they earn too much. And now everyone was happy to have a PCR facility and they, when they said we can increase it next week, well, everyone was suddenly a, a good friend of the lab services. So there were some changes, you're right, but not, not in terms of financing. What, what about Italy? Have you seen any, any change also in terms of budget? Was that maybe even increased or was that at well, still in the same frame and well, it shifted in perception? In terms of reputation and attention, uh, and attention to pay the two physicians, nursing and uh, healthcare professionals, Obviously, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, everybody was saying, oh, fantastic, we need uh, good doctors, uh, you are the heroes, uh, saving yeah. lives. But it was just the words, I mean, just chatting. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, uh, uh, I don't recognize any structural change in the hospitals, in the structure. Obviously, as Hara said, uh, now, in some labs, uh, we have more, obviously, facilities because uh, <laughs> fact of the life, you have to test more people. But, uh, for instance, in, term, in terms of uh, healthcare expenditure, uh, normally in the last 10 years, uh, 
the, the, the growth of the, 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 the public health expenditure was roughly 1% every year. Uh, but in 2020 was 5.3%. And mm -hmm. uh, we said, oh, fantastic. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the 2021 is expected uh, had just 1.2 and, and 1.6 and 1.6 for the for the future. So it was just you know a kind a kind of uh, fire, but now we are still uh, taking into account a very slow increasing uh, budget uh, for uh, for healthcare. And uh, you know, particularly uh, according to our situation, is it, is a bad news because, for instance, Germany is spending, uh, roughly speaking, 11.7 something percent of GDP, and Italy only 8.7. Uh, so just, just to understand that in terms of the total resources, we are below, but still uh, uh, the promised uh, increasing spending uh, is not there. Mm. Uh, very small uh, increase in spending, so uh, which is a uh, uh, a problem, obviously. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, I I, I can fully agree. Maybe just um, uh, an add-on question to you, Stefano. I mean, I had a discussion earlier this year. We're still in 2022. When I had discussion on, let's say, expected future pricing, where I was let's say, um, more thinking about the hypothesis that the pressure, still again before the Russian uh, attack in the Ukraine, but um, the question was rather if prices for drugs might be, let's say, under further pressure because of the potential negative budget impact. And I heard it was an Italian uh, expert. He was more the opinion that at this time, he was more thinking that no, because of the better perception that it might be potentially even not easier, but a better kind of environment to discuss and negotiate a higher price if you have the right evidence. Uh, would you? I guess you would disagree. If I heard uh, you, right, would you just? I, if I may say, I totally disagree <laughs> because uh, uh, I made uh, uh, maybe it's wrong. Obviously, it's my opinion, but I made a very simple uh, uh, rationale. If you if you like, first of all, we have to take into account that uh, we have an increasing of the public debt, mm -hmm. uh, which is absolutely enormous. For ju just mm -hmm. a few numbers, I know that maybe I know in you, but just to, to understand, for instance, uh, the recent program of the French government to reduce uh, the public debt uh, proportion on GDP uh, is to reduce by 1.8%, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, reaching the total uh, of this uh, rate, of uh, 113.5. In Germany, they, they aim to reduce uh, this rate only 1%, but uh, uh, the objective is to obtain 72.2, uh, <laughs> the rate. <laughs> mm. And uh, Italy is planning to reduce 4.1%, uh, which is four times that uh, your country, uh, reaching the 149.4% ratio public debt mm -hmm. GDP. So mm -hmm. we have a very, very strong constraint. So this is the first uh, aspect to take into account. The second aspect, as I said, they already planned quite a slow healthcare expenditure growth. Mm -hmm. So take into account uh, this one and this uh, second uh, aspect, uh, uh, I think that uh, also taking into account that probably the majority of the, the increasing budget will be devoted to community care because uh, GPs, uh, home care, telemedicine, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. other aspects that uh, they grow dramatically. Uh, you may understand that for pharmaceuticals, there is no, no room at all. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, the pharmaceutical expenditure in the last two years was roughly, roughly quite uh, uh, stable, mm -hmm. but definitely uh, I think that it's not possible to, uh, to foresee any uh, strong uh, uh, increasing on the opposite, a strong push to contain pharmaceutical spending uh, as much as possible.
uh, I, I, that's absolute. Well, I think it's, it's quite sure. There are also other aspects. Uh, maybe we can discuss like later. But uh, uh, IFA guidelines uh, uh, increase the uh, utilization of uh, generics and biosimilars. Uh, uh, decreasing role of the manager entry agreements, for instance. Mm. As you know, pharmaceutical companies uh, like very much uh, these agreements because it's a way to maintain uh, a, a relatively high price because there is the agreement. But in the last few years, uh, very few outcome-based or cost-sharing-based agreements have been uh, decided by IFA. Uh, on the opposite, more annual caps, price volume agreements. So, you know, it's uh, all these aspects all together are giving to me the idea that uh, uh, even if, as you said correctly, that uh, for the public opinion perspective, there is more attention to the, I would say the pharmaceutical as, as a sector, absolutely <laughs> relevant. Uh, vaccines uh, has been considered a kind of miracle, uh, science and so on. But when we go exactly in the field of public spending, I guess that probably we, we, we have, uh, the next years with more uh, stringent uh, uh, cost containment uh, uh, measures for pharmaceutical expenditure. That's my understanding. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I think that was a good kind of, let's say, uh, words uh, to move, let's say, discussion even further. I mean, how it helps. I mean, um, we, we obviously, let's say, um, have spoken now um, primarily on COVID-19, but if we, let's say, add the other component into the equation, which is the, the, the war in Ukraine, which obviously is, is uh, already, let's say, uh, very bad for the inhabitants, I think for the individuals for sure. Uh, but I mean, if we, let's say, put that, let's say a bit more on the, let's say macro level and the potential impact um, on the budget, we have heard, I think uh, um, the government has just said, uh, we'll spend a hundred billion euros into the defense. I mean, we have heard what uh, um, Professor Lauterbach has, uh, has announced, what he would like to have in terms of further measurements, as Stefano has as well uh, pointed out for Italy. What are your thoughts for the, let's say, next, let's say, two or three years, but maybe starting with the next kind of potential containment measures, given not only the COVID impact, but also the potential, let's say, impact on the economy, not only from the, from the Ukraine war, but generally, but also then, let's potentially say, another focus, a refocus of the financing of the public spending. Yes, well, you could have added another term on your headline, not just uh, Ukraine war, but also 7.3% inflation rate in Germany. Absolutely. 7.3%. Yeah. And in some countries in Europe, it, it's breaking the 10% threshold, yeah. like in Spain. Yeah. And of course, this will have an impact on the whole community, yeah. also on the German economy. And the ECB, the European Central Bank here in Frankfurt, how will they react? They have to do something. And that will have also an impact, again, on the German economy. Now, the whole issue started, quite frankly, before the war in Ukraine. Uh, we had already roughly 4.5% reached before this war started. And now the war um, is just speeding up the whole process. And um, the effect is, is, is negative on the economy. Another issue besides 100 billion defense extra spending is the gas subsidies, subsidies for, for gas, for energy. Well, and, and the problem is um, we were facing a deficit of 5.8 billion in 21 in the healthcare system. And usually we would call politicians, please send us fresh tax money. Mm -hmm. But that is over. Where should the money mm -hmm. come from? And in, in 23, we are facing a 17% billion, a 7 bill, 17 billion deficit. Again, what can we do if not asking for fresh tax money from the finance minister. Well, just two ways left open. Number one, increase of the contribution rate that will affect again employers as well as employees. So there's also a certain limit. And then cost containment. Well, cost containment, that's it. Um, the good old cost containment tools have to come out. 
uh, that is budgets, uh, efficiency audits, uh, new rules for, for pricing, for drugs, new DLG system, all, all that would come now again on the table. And you mentioned the draft that was issued by the Minister of Health for drug pricing last week. Now he had to withdraw it immediately, of course. <laughs> uh, there was protest from the Liberal Party, the drug industry, but that's a usual game. The next proposal will come surely in May or, or June. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, I was already joking that I think uh, Professor Lauterbach was just, uh, let's say, um, um, starting now to work with the same team as his, his the former Minister of Health, mm. uh, uh, Jens Spahn. I mean, he, I think he was really good in pushing a lot of his wish list out. I, mm. I, I was saying it's kind of negotiation mass, right? Yeah. And then he right. finally got what he really wanted, mm. right? So that is also how I read it a bit. Uh, what we had game. Just heard that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But what, what do you think might be really the ones which could really come into place. Any kind of gut feelings? Yeah. Well, I think um, uh, the, the first draft came as no surprise. Everything that was mentioned there was simply foreseeable. So the continuation of the price freeze, of course, otherwise the industry could easily escape all measures. Um, then uh, the closure of the orphan drug loophole, yes, or make it at least a little bit smaller, of course. And then the increase of mandatory discount. Yes, of course. And, and everything would, would remain, I think. Question is what just to what extent, what they, what percentage. But maybe some other tools like combination therapies, new assessment scheme. That would be very interesting. Because what they now just have suggested, the mandatory discount, 15%, I would say it's not the big solution. We need an own new methodology for combination therapies not just in oncology. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it, it was already a discussion uh, years ago. I mean, Stefan, how do you see that for, for, for Italy? I mean, maybe taking that, let's say, combination discussion also on board. I mean, I know that obviously you have had the IFA registry already since many years, but I mean, you have, as what just said a couple of minutes ago, that those managed um, uh, agreements were not really reached uh, a lot of times now but in the, in the, Let's, uh, let's say last one and a half to two years. How, how do you see that evolving in Italy, especially with those costly combination products? Uh, uh, I think that um, one possibility is uh, to start uh, do not reimburse some products, for instance, mm -hmm. unless mm -hmm. uh, they are applying uh, a quite high discount. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, again, the example in oncology is quite uh, evident. We, we have a lot of combinations. We have a lot of also mono therapies that compare to the, to the current therapies when they arrived new as a new therapies or new combination, the, 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 the added benefit in many cases are minimal, minimal. So uh, I think that uh, IFA and honestly, I hope will try to uh, uh, reimburse some new combination in the future only if a uh, uh, major discount would be applied. I'm talking normally about confidential discount. Uh, uh, in the last uh, mm -hmm. one, two years, uh, the confidential discount were quite heavy. So uh, if you look just to the X-Factory price, uh, it, it's confounding because the net price that hospitals are paying is dramatically lower. Um, I'm quite interested to, to, to note this evening that uh, in Germany, they want to apply the, this 15% or so mandatory discount, which is something that Italy applied many years ago for uh, many years. Then finally, they decided to stop uh, because obviously for, for, for the industry is not a particularly uh, uh, good news. And uh, so they change, uh, 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 they change the approach. I don't know, honestly, if uh, also in Italy, in the next future, this kind of measures that uh, have been applied years ago would maybe come back again. Uh, mm -hmm. in, if there is, uh, if, if there will be some uh, pressure, uh, since uh, this uh, mechanism has been already applied, could be also applied uh, in Italy, but there is no discussion at the moment, honestly. Uh, so I think that the major, 
uh, 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 mechanism will be uh, increased confidential discount, uh, uh, even maybe not reverse some combination that honestly are not given particular advantage because now in some uh, uh, areas we have uh, many competitors. So uh, why to have the new combination uh, 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 in order to pay more? Because obviously we know that when oncologists and clinicians have more alternatives, there is a kind of supply induced demand uh, phenomenon. So <laughs> they are using more, thera more therapies than, uh, than in the past. So th th that could be possible, but again, I think it's quite, uh, um, I, I think we are facing uh, the next few years with quite, uh, uh, quite a big problem. So I, I agree with Harald, some new mechanism has to be uh, think, has to be put in place in mm. order to to find uh, the very difficult balance uh, between uh, 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 the research and development costs uh, belonging to the industry, obviously uh, the marginal profit that they need by definition, otherwise no research and no new drugs and uh, uh, the public spending and uh, the so-called consumer welfare, because uh, you know, it's uh, uh, according to to the rocketing uh, uh, of prices uh, in the last few years is not more affordable, uh, I think. And, and, and it's very difficult to defend uh, this uh, uh, so rapid uh, increasing the prices just to say that uh, the cost of research and development is very high. Uh, that's why that uh, a lot of products now are coming uh, uh, for rare diseases. Mm -hmm. Because for rare diseases, this kind of balance uh, at the moment uh, is broken because they said, oh, we, we have only 20 patients. You have only 100 patients, so you can spend one million and a half for a therapy. I'm not sure that uh, we still uh, be in this kind of position uh, in, in the next future, even if uh, this the subject of rare diseases is very, I would, I would say, emotional subject. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to to make savings in this area, but uh, could be possible to, to, to do something also here. Mm, interesting, yeah. I mean, um, an interesting question we also just got from the uh, audience here, um, slightly moving away from Italy and Germany, but maybe obviously interested in your opinions. What do you think about the financial and clinical implications of COVID-19 and the war in the emerging markets? Will they potentially also follow, let's say, what you have just said for Italy and Germany? Or would you maybe think it might even get a bit worse in those kind of directions or maybe totally different? What is your opinion on the emerging markets? It's for me. I think for both of you. Yeah. Well, um, Harald, <laughs> do you have some opinion? <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, you're, you're referring to the BRIC countries, I would say. Mm, and here yeah. I want to... Um, leave out Russia because I uh, the prognosis yes. on Russia, I would say, yes. is, is a disaster, I would say. Yeah, because okay. one thing is clear, when the war is over, either next week, next month, or next year, we, we cannot just continue and say, uh, old, old game, right? And uh, that, so that I, I would say the prognosis is very dark. And the other countries, China, well, they face a big problem. China is not in a good position. Uh, look with a shutdown now in Shanghai, uh, look uh, with the economy, very bad outlook. Um, India, well, again, not a, maybe the hardest tr struck country of all BRIC countries in terms of COVID-19. Uh, the mm -hmm. situation in India was, was a disaster what happened there. And, and Brazil, yeah, again, the outlook is also very negative. So yes, I think it's, it's, it's a fair statement to say that the impact on COVID-19 was even worse for those emerging markets. Well, I, I perfectly agree with Harald. The only, uh, I would say, optimistic <laughs> point <laughs> is that uh, uh, because these countries are quite far for our standard, uh, we are rich mm. countries, uh, they have a good opportunity to put in place more efficient mechanisms that we didn't put in place in the past in our countries. 
for instance, uh, talking about uh, 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 pharmacological treatments, uh, they have the opportunity to, to take more, uh, I would say, efficient decisions to restrict some treatments, to make available only, uh, I don't say essential drugs, but, uh, you know, uh, only the very best in some way, without excluding all the others. Uh, because otherwise, as Harald said, in this country, the situation is... Uh, is getting worse and worse. So uh, only if they try to be very uh, uh, rational with the rationing uh, <laughs> the resources could be possible to, to grow a little bit because uh, the healthcare systems in, in these countries are quite uh, in a very bad situation. Uh, and I agree, Russia is obviously even in, in the worst situation because after the war, uh, I think that apart from the, uh, you know, uh, uh, ideological uh, talks uh, that we are hearing uh, every day about uh, 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 occidental countries, uh, Russia, and uh, crimes, and etc., I hope that uh, our governments will be quite clever, which is quite a paradox, if you like, to help Russia to grow a little bit because the situation in Russia also for the healthcare system is a disaster. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we need uh, Russia <laughs> as an emerging country to still be an emerging, not <laughs> a, a decreasing country. So uh, we, we'll see after a while what happens. Yeah. Yeah it's, a, uh, yeah, it's a very good point. And I mean, just maybe also take here history, right? I mean, we have seen yeah. what could happen after first after the first world war if you oh, don't yeah. let's say um find a solution also let's say for the enemy in a way right exactly yeah, exactly it could even get worse uh, the idea that we have to punish uh yeah. the enemy because uh, they made uh, absolutely wrong uh, incredible decision okay the war is incredible is 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 it the bad then uh, we have to to live uh, even after the war Mm. And we, we need the cooperation among countries. Without cooperation, uh, maybe a next war is coming. <laughs> As you said, exactly, the history is there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And, that's and also, for the economic point of view, just to, to be in some way uh, thinking about our interest, is also yeah. of our interest to have uh, neighbors uh, that, are, that have a good. Uh, economic development, not having uh, uh, neighbors uh, that are decreasing the, 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 uh, the, the, the status uh, from the economic point of view is not a good also for us. I mean. Yeah, no, that's true. And that was always the idea of the European Union, by the way, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. We have to say that the European Union started, uh, was created, first of all, for the economic perspective. Exactly. And uh, the politics followed. Because uh, if you are uh, in peace uh, and growing uh, both countries, uh, why to do a war? I mean. <laughs> exactly. That was always the idea. <laughs> yeah, in principle was the idea. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Perfect. So coming to the end, um, maybe um, I'll, I'll pass over, let's say, my favorite uh, final question I mean, to both of you each. I mean, if the, if the Minister of Health would call you tomorrow, and would ask you for your one key advice to do in the healthcare system, whatever thing would you like, right? Either, let's say, a kind of further containment measure, a relaxing some other measures, or anything in the healthcare system, what would it be? The one thing you would maybe tell the health minister, maybe how it helps, you could maybe start. Well, uh, I'm, of course, focused on the drug assessment. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say uh, you're perfectly right. We need a reform, some adjustment of our drug assessment system. Um, but that is not enough. I would tell you we need more than this. We need maybe mandatory switching to biosimilars. That's mm -hmm. one big step. Then it would be greater use of reference pricing, level three. Um, but of course, when you look at the increase of 17 billion in, in 21, 50% uh, of this increase in expenditure came from DLGs from hospitals. So the hospital system is a big issue in Germany and we should not just focus on drug expenditure. The two big things is uh, 
drug expenditure and DRGs and hospital. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I would say um, that is an ongoing issue. And the whole discussion with excluding now pediatrics and uh, uh, obstetrics mm -hmm. and, and psychiatry again, I don't think that we have a good solution here. So that's, that's a lot of work to do here also in this field. And that was a very good answer. Thank you. Um, Stefano, what would it be for Italy? Well, for Italy, uh, I have just two, two subjects. Uh, one, again, uh, for the pharmaceutical aspects. Uh, I, I take the, the suggestion for Harald uh, to, to, to have mandatory biosimilars utilization, mm -hmm. because now mm -hmm. each regional health authority is pushing, but still uh, is up to the clinician. So uh, there is uh, some hospitals where the rate uh, of biosimilar utilization is not very high or, you know, so that's a very good idea. Another one, which is, uh, well, I'm quite uncertain to say, but uh, uh, to introduce finally uh, the cost effectiveness analysis, obviously a serious one, not just, you know, talking <laughs> about numbers uh, in order to be able to restrict uh, some products, uh, not given particularly increase in price. Uh, and outside the pharmaceutical, if I were to choose just one, uh, I would say we have to change completely the GP's uh, system that we have in Italy. Uh, because as you know, uh, uh, having a good uh, uh, system uh, before uh, uh, the hospitals uh, is crucial in terms of quality of care, in terms of uh, total expenditure, in terms uh, of also pharmaceutical expenditure and so on. So, uh, and uh, there is a lack of, of, of efficiency. Uh, our system has to be completely reformed, I think. So I would suggest this. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good one. Um, we, we take one last question, let's say from, a, from one of the participants. I think um, it, it, it's. I think it, it's probably still summarizing everything at the end of the day. Um, obviously, we have had COVID, uh, the war, the the dependence of the let's say different country from foreign country, whether it's gas. I mean, it was before in the COVID area. It was the let, let's say started with the masks, right? I mean, it was just uh, ridiculous in a way. Um, the question, basically, by uh, that uh, um, participant is, what is the solution to avoid similar cases in the future? Do we need more Europe? Do we need to think more as Europeans and less as national country citizens? I mean, if I follow some of the discussions now, I could even go a bit further back, right? Um, but what is your opinion on that? Do we need more Europe? Or do we maybe need to think further, let's say independent as individual countries having both issues, let's say, bit in mind, COVID and the current situation around the war? That's for me, okay, well. Uh, I, I think definitely uh, we need more Europe, absolutely, with the specification. Yeah. Uh, you know now the rules are that every decision has to be taken uh, 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 with the, the vote of uh, all participants, all countries. So it's enough that one small country said, says no, it's not possible to do nothing. So mm -hmm. we have to reform this taking the majority, as in, in every democracy, <laughs> yeah. is the majority, not the totality. And uh, unfortunately, I have to say, probably to restrict a little bit uh, uh, the, the, the European Union. We are too many. We are too different. I think that uh, an European Union with, uh, roughly speaking, I don't know, 15 countries uh, could, be, could be fair enough in order to do a lot of things in order to have a kind of a European federation, if you like, uh, because uh, this war is, uh, is, uh, is uh, telling us that we need uh, uh, politics, uh, a common pol policy for every, uh, in, in many aspects, fiscal policy, uh, uh, because uh, if now we want to spend the money for the army, uh, uh, because it, the perspective is to have an European army, for instance, is not possible. For, a, for a, a state as a whole to have an army, a, a, just a common army without a common policy. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, th that's why I think more Europe, uh, but uh, in, in the objective to have a, a, a real federation of uh, the most relevant countries, could be 15, I don't know how many, 
for sure not to 27. <laughs> Anybody else? Your opinion on that? Well, more Europe um, sounds good, but in terms of uh, the uh, the pandemic, I think there was no no big deficit. We had a joint procurement of vaccines. Yeah. It, it took some time, and then U UK was quicker and took away some some share. So um, that was not so nice. Uh, but in in terms of providing uh, avoiding any any future conflicts or wars. <laughs> What can I say? A stronger foreign policy, I would say, a stronger European foreign policy. That that is that was a little bit neglected, is my mm. perception in the last yeah. twenty years. Yeah, that is. Uh, I I can only agree with that. So, I think that's the end of it. It was a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. I think your opinions, your your insights. I think was I think was really also good to get the two perspectives from Germany, from Italy. Um, also the differences uh, now finally also uh, thank you Luca uh, for the question also in Europe so we could end in a way into that kind of European concept um, with some of further ideas so um, obviously if everybody else obviously is further interested in the next webinars our webinars always on the last Thursday of a month and the next one is with our good friend uh, Dr. Markus Tarnheimer and it's uh, at that point in time it's uh, exactly six months before the NUP deadline so hospital funding, how it helps, you mentioned it, be mm. beyond the NOOP, but it's a key component, I think, also the issue sure. what we currently sure. have. So let's uh, let's just see what we get out of that kind of, the, of uh, discussion. Having said that, I want again to thank both of you, also the participants, looking forward and have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Keep safe. Thank you very thank much. You. Take care. Bye-bye.